Guardside Sparrow. Jack Guardside came up with this fly a number of years ago and uh, I was introduced to it about 15 years ago when I was steelhead fishing up in Michigan. Uh, it has become one of my favorite flies uh, to tie and to fish uh, different species. It's a good trout fly as well, but I just enjoy tying the fly mostly. Uh, it is just a really unique pattern. All of the materials with the exception of the dubbing and the body here all come from the skin of a ring-necked pheasant. It's kind of interesting if you haven't taken a look at uh, a skin of a pheasant, ring-necked pheasant, lots of, of really, really nice feathers, different colors, different, uh, I don't want to say even textures, different patterns on them, uh, just really, really uh, interesting. As you'll see in the video, all of the different components come from uh, the different different feathers on that skin and I just kind of like flies that are done that way uh, just something about them is is attractive to me but anyway that is the Gartside Sparrow and we'll get started Start our sparrow by placing our hook on the vise. This is a Mustad 9671. It's a 3x long streamer hook. This is a size 8. You're going to debarb the hook. You can tie this fly generally anywhere from a size 4 on down to a size 14. For thread, I'm using a Wopsy UTC Ultra Thread 70 denier in an olive color. Depending on the overall color of the fly, if you want um, more of a brown, even a black dubbing or something like that in there, you can change the color of the thread. Generally, olive is the general color because the overall fly takes on more of an olive color. You could place some wraps of lead along the hook shank if you want to add a little bit of weight. I'm going to stop with my thread just past the barb of the hook excuse me, just past the point of the hook. This is where we're going to tie in our tail. As I had mentioned, predominant material in this is ring-necked pheasant. It's one of the things I like about this fly. Uh, everything but the dubbing basically comes from this one skin. Tail is made from marabou feathers, which are taken right from the back end of the rump. This one's been kind of picked over, but there's also some other kind of downy feathers, you know, uh, marabou looking feathers, even underneath the shoulders. If I can get this on camera. So if you pull back some of the shoulder feathers, you'll also have some kind of downy feathers, a little lighter in color right up under here. At the same time, you could also just use some regular marabou or even a grizzly marabou uh, feather. I've selected two different feathers simply because these two will uh, give me a little bit more a bulky tail to it. The tail doesn't need to be too bulky and we don't want it too long. So I'll match those up so the tips are even. I want the tail to be just about a shank length long, not even quite a hook length long. It's not a very, very pronounced tail on this. I'll wrap backwards towards the barb just to anchor that in and then I'm going to wrap forward. I'm lashing down other parts of the marabou feather here just to add a little bulk to the body. I want to get up to about the two-thirds point on the hook shank there. Trim away the excess. This area up front is where the collar will go in, as well as the hackle on the, for the head. So I leave that a little bit less bulky. It's easier to tie that in. But as you can see, normally this part of the feather would be cut off. 
but we're going to actually use it. It just kind of bulks it up a little bit. So the tail is in. I'm now going to put the dub the body on. Now the dubbing for this is traditionally it's a homemade dubbing that Jack Gartside developed and it is made of uh, gray squirrel, natural rabbit, and some antron. The antron and the natural rabbit, there's one part of each of those and two parts of the gray squirrel. So there's, there's twice as much gray squirrel. You blend it all up and it makes kind of a nice spiky dubbing. The antron gives it a little bit of sparkle. I prefer to use the natural gray squirrel and the natural rabbit. You could certainly use a dyed if you're wanting to get a, an overall color. But even the Antron itself will help to give it more of, in this case, an olive color. That's an olive Antron in there. Or you could do a black or a brown or something like that. The body on our Sparrow is a tapered body, generally. It's going to be narrow in the back, tapering on up towards the front. So I will make a noodle here that's probably going to be three or four inches long. I like to make my dubbing noodles sparse because it gives me more control as I'm applying the dubbing. I can either space the wraps out a little bit or even wrap over each other a little bit more. It just allows me to have more control over the taper as I work forward. This will probably this one's uh, I'm going to say about four to five inches. Do it however you're comfortable with. This will probably get me about three fourths of the way up, and then I can add a little bit more. up to about the two-thirds point right here we want to leave a good bit of room for our uh, collar as well as the head hackle on this um, as you can see by having a, a sparser dubbing noodle you actually have a little bit more control it takes a little bit longer you're not putting all your dubbing in on one application as you go from the rear of the fly on up but you have a little bit better control on that so for the hackle on this, or the collar, again, we're going to be using a feather from our ring-necked pheasant. And Jack Gartside like to use these rump feathers here, these that, that have the kind of bluish-green colors to them. Can be kind of difficult on some skins to find feathers that have barbs on them right here that are long enough. You want the barbs to extend almost the length of the fly, even going past it a little bit is fine. 
So keep that in mind if you're picking up a skin at your local shop or somewhere else. Look around on that skin for the feathers and the quality. Are they they going to meet your needs for what you're looking for? Um, because believe it or not, the, all these skins aren't quite the same. Uh, you'll find some that have better quality feathers for what you're looking for. So I've selected one here, has a little bit of the blue and the green on the tips simply because um, on this skin, most of the ones that have pronounced blue and green on the barbs here are much shorter. What I'm looking for is a feather that has most of the barbs that I'm going to use right in this area right here are going to be about the length of the body. They can expand, extend past the tail a little bit if you want, but I, I like them at least to be about the length halfway down the tail, if not uh, the full body. Keep in mind, when you're selecting this, you also want to save this part of the feather right here. This is called an aftershaft. A lot of people refer to it as aftershaft feather, but it is actually part of the feather. If you can see, this is where the feather is growing out of the skin and in the process of growing this feather this aftershaft piece actually develops along with the entire feather. Now, a lot of people call this a phyloplume and that is incorrect. The, the phyloplume is a different feather in the avian world. Not all birds have phyloplumes but almost all birds that I've ever run across skins have aftershaft feathers. Some of them are pretty small. If the birds are small, pheasants are pretty good size. So this is an aftershaft feather. And as I mentioned on the skin, you may uh, take a feather like this off of the skin and find that the aftershaft feather is broken or it's not quite the quality you're looking for to tie with with the sparrow. So you can open that skin up and then look around at the base and you'll find other aftershaft feathers so you you can look around you don't have to take the one off the feather that you select you can look around a little bit and find maybe some better aftershaft feathers there i'm going to go ahead and process this hackle for our collar i'm going to strip away all the fluff Be careful as you're stripping this away, you want to take it in small sections starting at the back because very likely, like I just did there, you're going to snap the feather and strip away the thicker parts of it. And that's fine. Your hackle pliers will still work on that, but sometimes it's nicer to have um, something longer just to hold on to. I only need a couple of wraps. This this collar right here is fairly sparse on the sparrow. So I'm going to get some of these barbs stroked down the other way like this. And then I will cut away the tip. This tip section here, keep in mind, if I can pick this up right, this whole tip section, you want to, if you're going to ever tie any of these sparrows in a smaller size, you want to go ahead and keep these. Just set them aside, put them in a little baggie or something, simply because if you're tying size 12s or 14s, those come in real handy. So with that anchor on my feather, I'll lash that in on the hook. Take my hackle pliers, and again, I'm only going to get a couple of turns of this around the body. This will tend to kind of stand out, almost perpendicular, and that's fine while we're tying the fly now, because in the water, after this swims around in the water a little bit, all of these barbs are going to flatten out along the body. So don't feel you have to, to lash this down um, 
up onto the dubbing here to try and get a more horizontal presentation of these barbs. Like I said, this will, as soon as these get wet and swing in the water, then it will be much more horizontal. And actually, you want them sticking out there because there's going to be more movement to them. They're going to move a little bit more water. It's going to be more attractive to the fish than just laying along the body. So I tidied up the head area here, and we're going to use that aftershaft feather that we took from that rump feather, and we're going to tie in our head. One quick note, I had mentioned a couple weeks ago in a video, the winter brown soft hackle, that the ruffed grouse that I was using has some really nice aftershaft feathers. This is a comparison between the two. This is the pheasant that just came off of that feather, and this is the ruffed grouse. Ruffed grouse is a little bit shorter, but it's, I don't know if they're called barbs on this, uh, but they, it's a little bit wider and it's a little denser. So keep that in mind, although the ruffed grouse is also just a, a flat gray color, whereas we've got more of a brownish, even a reddish kind of gray, in the pheasant. There's another ruffed grouse. So keep these around. You know, if you're going to tie a bunch of sparrows, and there's some other flies also that use aftershaft. So I'm going to anchor in the very butt end of that aftershaft feather and advance my thread to the eye of the hook. The one caveat with these after, aftershaft feathers, if I say that right, is that these stems are very, very weak, especially out towards the end here. So you're going to have to, it takes a while to kind of get a feel for it, but you really, really have to be careful with these. The very tip of this right here, you want to go ahead and pluck that off. And that just gets rid of the very, very end, which is weak, because I guarantee if you clip onto the very tip of that, your hackle pliers, you will snap that off. Matter of fact, probably three out of five flies that you tie, you're going to snap even this part off. The I'm going to start wrapping this around. I'm not worrying about folding back the fibers as I bring it around. Rather, I'm going to brush back what's wrapped onto the hook shank before I bring that around. If I try to hold the feather vertical like this and stroke the feather this way to get all of the, these fibers folded back, I'm gonna break that tip every time. I am hardly putting any pressure on the tip as I am wrapping this around. Just get that wrapped in as best you can. But as I said, be prepared. You will break some of these at some point as you're wrapping that in. Fold that back and then you're just going to put in a very, very slight Head to the fly. It does not have to be pronounced or large. Five or six turn whip finish. If you have some of the tip of that that's real long like this right here, you can try to grab just the very tip of it like this. Maybe just pop some of that off so you're keeping a little bit in there, but if it does pop all the way down to the end, you're fine. If you want to, you can also tie these um, with a little bit more space up here and put two aftershaft feathers in there for a little bit bulkier. The idea of this up front is as this is swinging in the water, it's going to be um, moving a lot of water out of the way and causing a mo more of a disturbance. 
but it had some in on both sides there. That will secure that and give that a moment. That is the guard side sparrow. This could be uh, insect larvae running around or being knocked off of a rock. It could be a sculpin. It could be the, the sparrow can represent all kinds of different things in the water. It's a fun fly. It's a nice little streamer. Like I said, one of my favorite flies simply because of all three of the four different components of this all come from the pheasant skin. I just think that that's pretty neat. Um, flies that are designed that way. Not not overly complicated, just all right there. All around good trout fly, steelhead fly, smallmouth, you know, warm water fly as well. That's the guard side sparrow. Thanks for joining me at the Vice today. I hope you learned at least a new pattern, if not a new technique, maybe a tip or trick here and there. If you have any questions about this fly or any of the techniques used in constructing this pattern, please leave them in the comments section down below. If you go to the trouble to ask a question, I'll go to the trouble to answer it. If you'd like to help dressed irons, please share this video with your friends and anybody you think that might enjoy this pattern. Until next time, remember, it's fly tying. If you're not having fun, then you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm.